Welcome back. So, you recall last time, we were attempting to solve problem 10. We're still trying to find our way to get Santa home. And this um, last stream, I don't know, ran into some challenges. Not only parsing the data, but realizing that, like, this set of problems is not the best showcase for Kotlin. So, yes, I can solve the problems in Kotlin, but um, after much reflection, I'm realizing that this isn't really benefiting me to continue persisting. So, what do we do? Well, this got me thinking, what can we do? I have an idea. So, we've seen this terminal before, yeah? Um, let's see. Okay, you can see it, I can see it. We've used this many a time for our stockfish development. And my lamentation with this is that I don't have a way of being able to view the problems at the same time as coding. Well, I gave that a little bit of thought. Um, as always, we have Kause giving us words of wisdom. Um, I can't quite understand that particular saying, but that's okay. Um, so watch this. Hey, check it out. We are using the advent of code website from a terminal. Okay, I, I think in my first coding stream for the advent of code challenge, I had alluded to this, that I could do this. Um, one thing you might not have seen before is this, which is, hey, look, now I've got two terminals, two shells going. So I can view the problems and I can code. But you say, um, we won't get live feedback if we do it that way, right? Um, fear not. All right, so here we reuse tmux to split our display. So if I occupy this other shell here with my process output, um, we can watch my programs execute. And fun as that is, it kind of leaves out one thing. Um, so here's our solutions to our problems that we've run so far. I've been coding these in Scala off stream. I did get through problem 10 and I was starting to think about how do I backport this into Kotlin and make this a educational experience and the answer is you don't. Um, I've been also watching videos um, on the YouTubes saying um, just proclaiming the benefits of Kotlin and so on and so forth and um, the one thing that keeps hitting home as people keep questioning the Kotlin team um, is that they need more white papers. And that's a Kotlin problem. That's not a Dan problem. So uh, there is one white paper advocating for use of Kotlin. And the explanation given is you want to do that on a greenfield project. And you know what? I don't have a greenfield project right now. So I shouldn't be bothered to try to shoehorn Kotlin into some of my existing projects unless I find a good use for it. It's a good language. It's not difficult to learn, but it's not apt to this particular challenge. And our goal is to get Santa home. And you know what? We can come back later and do the problems in Kotlin later if that ends up being so beneficial. So... Uh, but I interrupted myself here. Um, so the other beautiful thing about using IntelliJ IDEA was that I was able to run my programs and get the output at the same time. Well, we can still do that. We can split our split terminal display. So now we've got live coding over here. Um, you definitely intend to start living sometime soon. All right, thank you, Kause, um, and Fortune. But yeah, now if I make some code change, um, so if I go
go into my source main Scala directory and look at problem 10 and I make some subtle change anywhere here. I don't know, like I changed the ID of a point to be 101 times X times Y. You'll see that the code recompiles in the top shell. I can even reorder these shells, I think. I'm not sure how that's going to look. Um, so maybe I think this would do that. No, I have that wrong. All right, that's not exactly what we were going for. So I can shuffle these shells. Um, I could also just, you know, switch which shell I'm using for which purpose. So here I could go there and say, I want to start coding here now. Um, so I can change directory source main Scala. And here I can look at problem 10. I could open the same file in multiple tabs. There's no real rhyme or reason other than that which I provide. Uh, so I think this layout might make the most sense. Um, so last we left off, um, so tilde run just dynamically runs all the code. Um, so last we left off, we were looking at problem 10. I should explain this browser here on the left is the W3M browser that runs in a terminal. Um, so day 10 was the monitoring station problem and says, for example, given this map, the best location for the monitoring station in the one of a, middle of an asteroid field is the one that sees as many asteroids as possible. And I solved that. Um, <laughs> so some of these inputs get pretty dense and complex to parse and really parsing was the thing that threw me over the edge here. Just, I didn't have the time and wherewithal to write a DSL that's like, I don't know. Uh, I could have written something stateful that would go through the characters one at a time. And I could have figured out a good way to parse and process that. But Scala offers such a superior grammar um, that, you know, that's what we're going to go with. Um, now, this is cool. So you see here that I had solved the problem. Problem one, I got answer 256. Now you see also in the bottom console, I've at some point introduced some sort of error. Value sign is not a member of int. You're correct. I'm not sure why this, compo why this code compiled yesterday and today it doesn't. However, signum is a member of int. Um, so this should dynamically recompile and produce my answer 256 that I got yesterday while doing this off stream. Um, and the reason we got a, some error here might be because I changed a character from 101 to 100. Let's change it back. No, there's other problems here. <laughs> Just my luck that as I'm hoping to do something instructive, um, oh, well, that's not exactly it. Um, can we shuffle this about until I get it right again? All right, so, um, yeah, no, what did I mess up here? I could have sworn that it was control B and then bracket to scroll up. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's control B and then not control bracket, but just bracket. So I've got a null pointer exception on an input stream reader somewhere in my code. Possibly the fact that I've updated my environment by way of using other programs inside this same user space could have broken something if my Scala version or Java version or something changed. Um, that could break this. So uh, that's the problem with not using a prepackaged solution is that I have to solve stuff like this. Um, but never fear, we'll figure it out somehow. <laughs> Even if that somehow is just use Google, we can work our way through it. 
Um, Reader.java78 at input stream reader at buffered source at main. Main line five is where I'm exploding. Um, okay. Uh, so let's go back to main. Uh, line five. Problem 01, source from resource 01.txt. And this is failing because of a null pointer in a library that I'm consuming. Um, there is an 01.txt resource file, right? It's still there? Yes. Okay, <laughs> let's try this a different way. Um, do all my tests pass? in this particular environment. I'm not going to be... Well, it's going to be somewhat encouraging if one of the tests fails, because then I don't have to go write more tests. But otherwise... Um, oh, I'm in the wrong directory. That's what's going on here. Uh, I need to go up some levels. That's what confused me, is that I didn't have a main type. Or that I did have a main type, but I was trying to find resources based on a project hierarchy that didn't make any sense. So what I intended to show um, was that here, um, here's the code that I written yesterday to solve this asteroid parsing problem. And we do parse it, and we get an answer of 256. And this still uses the notion of, like, here's a graph, and here's an edge, and an edge contains two points, and a point contains an x and a y. Um, and you might question, well, how am I doing all my parsing? Well, I have the main class read in the text of the entire file as a string. And then I call run here. Run takes that string. Uh, assembles a graph from it, and then computes what is uh, the rank, the uh, number of asteroids seen from any given asteroid. Um, and part two of the problem, which we did not get to yesterday, was now that we have the coordinates, our elves are uh, giving us um, control of this really powerful laser that vaporizes asteroids in its path. However, it can only vaporize one at a time, and it sweeps an arc pointing vertically or pointing northward and just sweeping its way around clockwise. Um, and they ask, they're, they're betting on which asteroid is going to be the 200th one in this given field to be vaporized. And so here's an example given where if you put the asteroid, put the laser at this X in the center, and you started sweeping, you'd hit this guy first, and then you'd hit this one, and then this one, and this one, and this one, and so on and so forth, and just keep rotating clockwise. Um, and that's cool. And so the elves are betting on which asteroid is going to be the 200th one to be hit in this immensely dense field. Um, they give you this information about the dense example that was up above, which was way up here, and saying that if you were to mount uh, the station, I don't know, some one of these points, they explained which one would be the 200th one to be hit in this case. And so I used all of that as test data. Uh, I should show that and not just tell you it, so let me show you it. So I've got a main Scala directory, but I also have a test Scala directory. And we can take a look at the problem 10 specification. So here's part one saying here's a problem spec. And a spec consists of here's the constant, the fixture that's shared by all the problems. And um, so this is just your calculator that solves all the problem 10 class of problems. Uh, here's graph number one. We're asserting that from um, one of these asteroids, we don't care which one, but it happens to be this one, that we can see eight other asteroids. And we can. Second one, the, well, the asteroid with the greatest visibility can has visibility to 33 other asteroids. And so on and so forth. 35 and 41 and 210. 
Uh, not only uh, so I put a resource here saying load this test resource 10.txt in as a string, uh, just taking all the characters with the new line characters in between, just read that as a single string, pass that in, uh, assemble a graph from it, verify that the point that has visibility to the most other points can see 210 other points, and then vaporize the asteroids, all 210 of them, in order. So here's the zeroth, which you would say is the first, and then the once, or the second, and so on and so forth, and number 199, has this ID of 802, meaning it's X position 8 and Y position 2, and you can see that underlined in the problem specification or the example data. This one right here, this 8, 2, that corresponds to this 802 right here. So that was cool. Um, and so all of my tests pass. Oh, I'm sorry. And then there was the other example they gave us, which was a much narrower graph. This is the one I spent more time debugging. Uh, once this one worked, um, this one mostly worked. Uh, the trick I had to apply to fully get that working. Um, so we have a main Scala problem 10. The trick I had to do to get the points ranked by angle uh, took a little bit of searching on Stack Exchange, but found that there is a function, arctangent, that describes the angle or the relationship between x and y. And for convenience of geometric uh, stuff, uh, there's also a math library function both in C and in Scala, or I guess in Java as well, called arctan2. Uh, arctan2 or atan2 uh, will compute an angle based on x and y and um, so that's the angle however it was undefined I'm sorry no it was defined in the case of x being 0 y being positive uh, however um, that point was being ranked last to fix that uh, that off by one error where the um, the point that should get shot first was the one that's getting shot last. Um, I just offset that ever so slightly by a hundredth of a unit, and this didn't affect any of the other computations. Um, so I got all those testing yesterday, and then I spent some time code golfing it and performance tuning it, and um, got it this and my other nine solutions about as performant as I can get them right now. So that's the backstory. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Um, because now we're going to buckle up and take us into the next space. So we'll run all our tests. Um, I'm trying to remember how I go back in this browser. I think there's a link back to, uh, yeah, here's back to the calendar. There's also some way with this W3M browser to shortcut your way back to the list. I know this is showing I have two stars. I don't. Problem 11 is the next problem, so let's tackle it. All right, day 11. Space Police. Now, I wonder, is this font too small? Is there something I need to do? I think this is legible. I think this will work. Uh, can I fit... Um, uh, I'll have to see if there's something I can do better about the scrolling so it doesn't jump as much. I know there's an options list in W3M. I did spend a little time looking through it. I could spend more time. Um, all right, but yeah, on our way to Jupiter on day 11, we're pulled over by the space police. Now keep in mind we just departed Mars. We're on our way to Jupiter. Attention, unmarked spacecraft, you are in violation of space law. All spacecraft must have a clearly visible registration identifier. You have 24 hours to comply or be sent to space jail. Well, crap, we got this yesterday. 
Guess we're going to space jail. <laughs> Not wanting to be sent to space jail, you radio back to the elves on Earth for help. Although it takes almost three hours for their reply signal to reach you, they send instructions for how to power up the emergency hole painting robot and even provide a small int code program, your puzzle input, that will cause it to paint your ship appropriately. There's just one problem. You don't have an emergency hole painting robot. You'll need to build a new emergency hole painting robot. <laughs> That, uh, I feel like we don't need the word emergency in there. I think this would work even if it were just a normal hole painting robot. Um, but that's not what our program's for. So, okay. The robot needs to be able to move around on the grid of square panels on the side of your ship, detect the color of its current panel, and paint its current panel black or white. All of the panels are currently black. The int code program will serve as the brain of the robot. The program uses input instructions to access the robot's camera, provide zero if it's over a black panel, or one if it's over a white panel, and then output two values. First, it will output a value indicating the color to paint the panel that the robot is over. So the IntCode computer will provide the output um, zero to paint it black and one to paint it white. Second, it will output a value indicating the direction the robot should turn. Zero means turn left 90 degrees and one means turn right 90 degrees. After the robot turns, it should always move forward exactly one panel. And its initial orientation, it starts facing up. The robot will continue running for a while like this and halt when it is finished drawing. Do not restart the ENCODE computer inside the robot during this process. For example, suppose the robot is about to start running, drawing black panels as a dot, white panels as an octothorpe, and the robot painting, uh, pointing the robot is facing. The initial state and region uh, near the robot looks like this. Yep, so it starts in the middle, um, paints, goes to the left, etc. The panel under the robot, not visible here because it has a carrot shown instead, is also black. And so any input instructions at this point should be provided zero. Um, because the panel's black, if you were to ask the color of the panel, um, the robot would return zero. That's another way to put that. Um, suppose the robot eventually outputs one, uh, paint white, and then zero, turn left. This is what uh, would look like after that step. Yep. So we paint this, uh, and then we turn left and move forward a step. In input instructions should still be provided zero. Next, the robot might output zero and then turn left. All right, after more outputs, one zero, one zero, the robot's now back where it started, but it's now on a white panel. The input instructions should be provided as one. After several more outputs, the area looks like the following. Okay, so each output uh, pair, each set of two outputs in a sequence consists of a color to paint and a color, a direction to turn. And that's it. Uh, before you deploy the robot, you should probably have an estimate of the area it will cover. Specifically, you need to know the number of panels that it paints at least once, regardless of the color being painted. In the example above, it painted uh, six panels at least once. It painted its starting panel twice, but it's still only counted as a distinct panel. Build a new emergency hole painting robot and run the int code program on it. How many panels does it paint at least once? Um, so the other fun piece of this is going to be figuring out how to download the puzzle input. 
So I'm not entirely familiar with W3M and its download capability. Um, we're going to figure this out. We'll do it live here. So there's our sample input. Uh, w just moves me forward. Colon doesn't do anything. S, I think, gives me a list of previous pages that I have been on. Um, D would delete buffer, which would be kind of unwise at this point. So this is the page I'm on. Uh, what other commands do I have? I just start typing letters. L goes a direction. X. Um, X, I'm not sure what that did. Other than... Um, all right, no previous regular expression. Do you want to exit? No. T Y U I O. O is all the options. Do I want to exit? No. Uh, so here's all the display settings. And I said I spent some time looking at this. I didn't look at every option here. Um, so I'm not sure how I'm going to get this input into um, like I could find a way with W3M to get this going, but it might be more expedient um, for me to just go back here and use another device to get the input into my problem file. Um, granted, the tests that I should be starting with aren't the sample input anyway. So the sample input is... Um, well, here's an example. They show, here's the robot, it's in the center, and they want to count the number of points that are visited with this example program. Um, so uh, we're doing test-driven development, kind of, sort of. Um, so we're going to create a new class. Uh, so we got source main Scala. And the last time we used a uh, computer, I think, was problem 9. So we are going to steal that computer. Instead of sharing it across files, um, we're just going to literally copy the file. And now we've got another IntCode computer. And we can change this computer if we so desire. But our goal is to make a robot, not to augment the computer. Um, so, also I could probably get rid of uh, the solution to problem the second half of that. Um, so the run function here, wait, how did I break this already? Oh, because there is no, no that's not it. This doesn't compile. I'm amused. Sequence. Oh, uh, execute to? No. Oh, I see, I see. Execute here is still invalid. Somehow the way I had written that earlier didn't make any sense. This does parse. It's all valid Scala. Um, so now we've got a problem 11. And uh, we want to produce a test for it. So let's copy our problem 9 spec and create a problem 11 spec. And um, we see immediately that that doesn't compile, so we produce a problem 11 spec. And we go strip out all these other tests that we don't need. Um, this test still fails somehow. <laughs> How did this fail? There must be an 11 somewhere in my input where there used to be an 09. Um, doesn't matter. So we're going to take the sample inputs that were given. Um, so our program is going to be input a 0, input a 0, and halt. That's going to be our program. Um, this doesn't need to use longs, unlike the problem 9 computer, 
which did have to use longs and was a total pain in the butt. Um, so this probably also won't need to use an array. Um, so now let's go vim uh, main Scala our problem 11 computer. Uh, change everywhere we use long back to using an integer um, because we don't need longs for everything. Um, we don't need a 2048 padded program. Program to buffer pad to stuff. Yeah, we don't need any of those capabilities of this thing. I mean, we might. You know what? Let's just leave it all in. Our computer doesn't need half of the stuff we're packing into it. Three long, zero long, three long, zero long, 99 long. That's a valid program. Um, but apparently needs to be a buffer because that's what my encode computer uses these days. Um, and, you know, I would have an assertion here, but let's just start with the simplest failing test, which is this. Or, I'm sorry, this doesn't fail yet. Um, first sample program um, should something. I should be asking this for output. Um, so... I'm confused. The output, let me take a look at the format of the output instruction. Yes, yeah, so this says read a value into a memory address. Um, so zeros as find a place to read the output is anywhere else. No, that's the output instruction. I want an input instruction, right? We still write a value. This is a three that we're writing to a memory address. No, 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 I have this wrong again. This is the encode computer. This is going to be driving the robot. This is not the robot. We need a class robot, um, which has attributes of a point. It has an X and a Y. Um, var x zero, var y zero. All right, and the robot is the head that's operating over the program. It's using an int code computer to do its business, um, but it's not a computer. It's an interpreter that uses the computer to do its work. All right, so what are the instructions for a robot? Um, so it too has a concept of a step and the step will take, oh, actually this simplifies things a bit, doesn't it? Um, so it's gonna take both a color to paint and a direction to turn. And that's what it's doing. Not sure if this makes things easier or harder. Not sure why we even use an int code computer for such a piece of equipment. This has me confused. All right, let's dismiss IntelliJ so we don't need it open. Um, also welcome. So I guess we're using the read and write capabilities of the computer, even though I don't get it. Yeah, this is confusing. So this is going to take two inputs. Um, 
So it's going to take a color, which is an int, and a direction, which is an int. I'm really not seeing how a program has anything to do with this. Build a new emergency hole painting robot and run the int code program on it. I should take a closer look at this int code program. Um, so I've got my chat device, I can just use that to look at the puzzle input and try to figure out what that's about. It's got a three in there. It's got a 1005. What's the five even for? I don't need a robot class, do I? I don't need to write a special robot. I am confused. They've thrown in the word robot to mask the whole int code thing. Um, yeah, it's not simplifying anything to add this new abstraction right now. Let's go back to TDD. Um, where we say our goal is to simply write a program and assert its correctness. Um, so the way in which I would assert a left turn in this robot would be what? I mean, I could just download the sample input, see if that somehow makes sense of the program. I guess, no, okay, what they mean by robot here is that um, whenever input and output instructions get executed, I should keep track of what's going on. Because the program is an int code format. Um, so the program, I don't know like how it keeps a concept of geometry. I guess that's the challenge is figuring out when I execute a program, what has happened. Um, Yeah, the specifications of these problems just keep getting weirder and weirder. All right, so a three is an input and a four is an output, or how does that go again? We've got three is a write to a memory address, and a four is a output from a memory address. So, and I want to assert that at the end of this, that here one left is equal to the output. Um, if I do this, wait, how am I doing a write instruction again? A write needs how many parameters? Oh, a write takes the input. So, um, yeah, no, I actually need to execute the computer. Here's my input of one. And assert that the output is one. All right, so that's a trivial int code program. Um, it's not really asking. Um, should output its input. So yeah, and if I were to take some other input here, zero, um, that input also would get um, 
Hmm. Well, that's curious. That's probably because I'm reusing the same computer. Um, like each of these tests individually would work. It's just I'd have to reset the computer between executions. Um, so the robot is going to be sending inputs like 0 and 1 here to the execute function. But the int code program itself contains things that are not zeros and contains things that are not ones. It's just an encode computer. And I'm not sure. Like, I could build such a robot, but what's the point if my program's in int code format? Is this asking what's the number of unique memory addresses that get written to? I'm not sure. Either way, I'm going to take this sample input and stuff it right into um, my test environment. So one second while we get that little chore done. Um, so again, I'm not entirely familiar with how on W3M I would download. Um, but let's change directory into um, advent source main resources vim11.txt and just drop that input right in. All right. So I've got 11.txt now. Oh, I'm sorry. I get it now. So I'm supposed to keep track of the list of inputs and outputs. Okay. And based on those inputs, I can compute a position. So, <laughs> the robot is going to intercept all the inputs and outputs so that I don't have to. Class robot. Um, So I don't really care about the colors that it reads in. I just care about the instructions that I'm feeding to this robot, this thing that's going to intercept um, every input instruction. I'm not even sure if this thing is stateful or not. It has an operation. Um, step. Well, it's got an operation for output and operation for input. I honestly don't care if it outputs. Um, I do care a lot if it inputs. But Okay, and so this robot does have things such as an x, a y, and a direction. Um, all right, this is starting to look a little familiar there. Um, so, yeah. I see, I see. And it also has a notion of a program counter. <laughs> uh, because every other instruction is a step instruction. So one instruction will say what color to paint. One will say what color to, t uh, what direction to turn. Um, and these are not commingled in the same instruction. That's the interesting point. Um, 
All right, so read, I don't really care. That's kind of a no op. Um, we're just gonna define a step. And it's gonna take an input. So, PC mod to match. Um, actually, this is just a binary thing. If PC mod 2 is equal to 0, we're going to do one thing. Else, we're going to do something else. Um, all right, so color to paint. Well, we do need to keep track of the list of positions at which we paint but that's going to be every position we walk to, at least right now it is. So we can no op on every other instruction and just assume we paint. Um, so this also is going to have a, con a concept of how many places did I visit, which we'll get to. Um, but okay, so here we've got output. And that's not going to be here anymore. Um, instead, here we're going to have some sort of mutable, all right, uh, path. I'm sorry, this is going to be var path is going, actually, since buffer is mutable, right? Um, wow, var x, var y, I guess those are convenient to keep around, uh, var direction. And we want to keep the list of all the places that we've been. So that's going to be val path is going to be a buffer. And the type collected inside of it is going to be int comma int. All right. I could make a point type. We've done it a thousand times. We don't need it right now. Um, so here, um, path. Now, do we do anything fancy with memory to extend it or pad it or whatever? I don't think we did. Um, but here we're going to be appending x comma y as a valid step. And it broke immediately. Great. Um, Okay, is it, is this how I append to a path? No. The receiver is not assignable. The receiver is a buffer. Of course it's assignable. Do I need like a mutable buffer type? Um, okay, screw this. Uh, well, no, if I, I don't know if I can reassign this, right? Um, did I mean plus plus colon, plus equal colon, or colon plus plus? Probably I meant one of those. <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> uh, let's try the one in the middle. Plus equals colon. Is that wrong? Plus equals colons, not a member of int int. All right, just kidding. Um, I probably meant one of those other things then. I should look up the grammar. No, so postfix prefix operators don't make any sense. Um, I think we're just mean that this dot path is equal to this dot path append x y. 
Um, yeah, no, I get that that's not a member of... Like, if I pick a list here, list would have done it, right? I don't need... Whoops. Yeah, no, this, this should work, right? That's not a member of int int either. What? So I've used that operator um, in a different program here. Okay, I did use it. It's not there anymore. Um, or it's in my... Up here. So I used it for list um, concatenated as a return type. Um, so why does that not work here? Um, what am I doing so differently here as opposed to problem six? So here I also had a path which is a list of type edge. And I was able to say uh, my point at the head of a list of points. Can I only do this sort of assembly this way? Um, do I have to like, do I have to do that? Okay. For whatever reason, this is the way you assemble lists recursively. So, okay, we'll keep track of the head of that path then. That's fine. Um, I guess that in some way makes it easier to find where I'm currently at. Um, oh, I could even rotate the matrix <laughs> if I felt nuts. Um, all right, so, oh, I see, I see. Um, so if I'm going to do default assignments, those have to come last. Int is equal to zero. At least I think they have to come last, right? Let's prove me wrong. If I were to do a default assignment here and a default assignment here, and a default assignment here, um, u for up. Oh, okay, ordering doesn't matter here like it does in other languages. Okay. Probably still want a default assignment for path to just be an empty list. Um, all right, that's fine. And if I felt crazy, then <laughs> so that was the color to paint. Um, why don't I put in this list one element at zero zero, right? And then I can say. Um, but we'll figure out. Yeah. Oh wait. So yeah, I do have a list of points I've already visited. So yeah, we should have zero zero in there already. Um, not that we need it. So since we don't need it, we'll do without. Um, else, our other instruction is going to give us a direction to turn. So, um, we need a way of translating an input into a direction. Um, so, else what? Uh, first, we're going to... <laughs> Uh, direction match. It's going to match one of our four directions. 
Um, I mean, I guess, wait, is there a down arrow thing notation? If there's a convention specified in the problem statement, I'll try to use it instead. Oh, V. Yeah, V is a down arrow notation. All right, fine. So we'll, we'll use the notation given by the problem. All right, uh, case um, this. Um, all right, uh, we're gonna say this dot direction is equal to, we're gonna apply this over here um, in the event of that return if uh, input is equal to zero turn left uh, which would be that else turn right and we'll just build this table up um, if we're facing left if we're facing right if we're facing down um, so if we're facing left, another left will take us down, would be a V. Our right would point us up. If we're facing right and we turn left, we go up. Else we go down. And if we're down and we turn left, that would be facing right. Else we're going to be facing left. Which is great, right? Um, Wait, can I do multi multiple assignment here? I could, but it would drive myself completely bananas. Um, so, um, well, shall we? This dot x comma this dot direction is equal to. Um, let's first verify that this can be done. Um, some parentheses over here, some numbers over here, uh, zero there, a zero here. This multiple assignment a thing doesn't look like it. Doesn't look like I can do this. Um, that's okay. Choosing a new direction is probably good enough for first step. Um, and then we're going to do this dot direction match. Okay. And say case um, up. Uh, this dot. Again, can I do multiple assignment? Because that'd be nice. Um, no. Um, we're going to try multiple assignment over here. Uh, zero comma zero. Does that work? Nope. <laughs> All right, fine. We'll do it one piecewise then. Um, this dot x is equal to that expression case left is going to be x minus 1. Case right is going to be x plus 1. Uh, Fault. It's just going to be x. Nope. Does this need a case keyword? Didn't think it did, but apparently it does. All right, just yank those five lines and do the same thing for y. And realize that I've probably made this way more complicated than necessary. Um, that's okay. Um, 
Also, I could factor the x and y out here. Uh, this dot x plus direction, negative 1, plus 1, 0. Also, uh, there's an operator in like every language that's just the plus equals operator. So uh, I say that. Um, found char required unit. Do I really have to encapsulate that? Apparently. All right. All right, and then we're going to add here a direction mapping to a value, which is either going to be 0 or a minus 1 or a plus 1. And for consistency, let's put the, it doesn't matter, right, left, up, down, OK. And every time we paint, we keep track of what where we've been in our path. Um, that's ugly as crap, but it'll do. And so now, every time we write, I'm sorry, every time we output, um, we're going to have the robot step the output instead of us stepping it. So, a uh, robot is going to be a robot. Uh, that's just going to be, I suppose it makes sense to force the consumer, no. Um, there's no need to force the uh, consumer to create one of these. I can create it for them. All right. Output is not a member of computer. Thank you, compiler. Um, robot dot output. There we go. Uh, except it's not called output, it's called step. Because robots walk. They make one step at a time. And this step has to be an int, doesn't it? Oh, wait. Robot type does not take parameters. Um, robot dot type does not take parameters. OK. And then on line 91, um, let's see, output dot make string. So this is now nonsense, uh, shan't be run, type mismatch of unit, return string. OK, it needs some kind of string for an output because I declared the return type. Rather than change the declaration, I'll just hack something together so it compiles. Um, value output's not a member of problem 11 spec computer. So now our test fails. And this is probably where I should have started, is that my test is still failing. So let's go back to our spec and get this um, to not fail. So if we've done a input an output. This is a really simple program. It's a really silly program. Um, Robot.path.length. Please tell me length is a member. All right, good. One is equal to the length of that path. Um, So our simplest test, trivial program should not walk. 
So in the event that we have a robot that goes zero distance, um, it should not go any distance. And there we go. Oh, I should also point out a fun little command test only. So if I want to just see a particular problem and how that's progressing, that's the way to do it. Uh, so trivial program is not walking. First sample program should um, walk however many steps. Ah, so walk some steps. I forget what the exact number is. We'll have to consult this. So the example they gave us um, uh, I'm not a fan of this example. Also, I'm not a fan that, like, I don't know. Yeah, they cover all this stuff about a robot doing this and a robot doing that. And I'm still exercising this at the level of an int code computer that's exercising the robot. I need to decouple the two if I'm going to do a real unit test. I'm certain my program works, but that's no fun. Uh, the real fun is... Um, uh, so I got to decouple these. So rather than talking about a trivial program in this parlance... Um, Let's try this at the level of a robot. And the robot doesn't need crap. Uh, it can stand on its own. We just happen to be wiring it to the computer. Um, so if it hasn't walked at all, then that's what it's been up to. Um, Oh, this is... Wait, how is that not stand on its own? I did declare it up here. I mean, yes, it has parameters, but those parameters all have default values, so it shouldn't need anything. And yet it claims to what? class robot. Here we have got a class computer. These are independent classes. I could separate out the encode computer to a different file. Am I really going to do that? That's not going to make this class work. The advantage of having separate copies of this encode computer everywhere is that if I need to change it, as I did for this example, then I can change it. Um, and while they conceived of this as a robot consuming an encode computer, I conceived of it as the other way around because that was more convenient. Um, but no, this has an X, a Y, a direction, and a path, each of which have a default value. Um, oh, I know why this didn't run. It's because I have an extra character at the end of the line. There we go. So our trivial program should not walk. Uh, first program should walk some steps. Um, here, let's, before I confuse myself, get rid of the bad test program. Um, simple program should walk. And what does it mean to walk? Um, this is kind of unfortunate. Uh, robot, that step. Now this does pairwise steps. Um, so the first was the color to paint, and the second was the direction to turn. And we're going to assert that it's gone one step. And it doesn't. 
so this doesn't work. Okay. Um, so before I go any further, let's figure out what happened to our dear robot. Uh, for example, when we start running, we paint white, and then we have a zero to turn left. Oh, and we move at the same time that we did the turn operation. We don't wait for another input. Just kidding. So this here is going to go there. And it's this painting step. Wait, no, but I had it right. It will walk, but the length of its path is determined. Um, it's already done one paint operation up here. One did not equal two. So why do I have a two? My path is a list of tuple int. I'm confused. And this is why you write the test first. This is exactly why you write the test first. Um, well, I mean, I didn't write too much code, but I evidently wrote, uh, <laughs> I didn't write a lot of code, but I wrote too much is uh, the observation. And we're just going to get better at this. Um, so it really doesn't matter what the instruction was here. Our, oh, I'm never incrementing the program counter. Where do I normally do that for my other machine here? Uh, oh, I see. I increment it with each instruction there. Um, this is interesting that, like, I want the pre. I want to increment the value of the program counter, but I also don't want to use the increment as the value for comparison. So we'll just save that for down here. PC++. Plus plus is not a member of int. Right you are. PC++ plus equals 1. To show reassignment. Uh, All right, so now our test passes. So we've done one step here. All right, now this talks about walking in pairs of output values, input values. Um, I don't suppose there's a way I could make that work. That'd be kind of nice. Uh, well. All right. So they give an example. I guess I'm just going to regurgitate the example here. Because they, yeah. After more outputs, they say, well. I mean, I could make a specialized double step function that just steps twice. Um, I don't like this, this mapping, but that's okay. Um, wait, is there, there must be some notion of, uh, 
being able to process multiple or a single value. Um, and Java, this is given variadic is the name. I'm pretty sure Scala doesn't have this. I'm pretty sure that Scala, you just use SEQ sequence to represent a variadic thing. Yeah, Scala language specification version 2.9 states in the repeated parameters, the last can be suffixed by an asterisk. The type is denoted as Scala.sequence T. Uh, so I could specify that this takes a long star um, and now that's a sequence. Um, so yeah, the type is unambiguous in that case. So the point here is yes, I could make something that accepts one or multiple arguments but I don't think my encode computers oh it is compatible with this um, interesting and then if I want to consume it on the other end can I just say sequence of one zero no Required long. Okay. Um, okay, but if I said 1L, 0L, would this understand? No. If I said 1L, 0L, now would it understand? Yes. So, okay, I can do that. Interesting. Um, now, did I have to put the longs there? There's implicit conversion. Implicit conversion still handles um, malformatted arguments. Uh, so that's fine. All right, so then what do we have? We keep turning left, correct? So then we paint a zero and turn left. And we paint a one and we turn left and we paint another one and turn left again. And we've done four steps and four did not equal two. Even though we've been turning left the whole time. Um, so when we get stuck, and this is a power of being able to, I don't know, work with a language that is not a toy language you can print out stuff um, with really simple scripting um, one zero 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 oh so even though I supplied multiple parameters they weren't iterated through um, that's also interesting. So I've confused myself by trying to use this fancy notation that I've never used before. Yeah, now if I reduce that to something simpler, um, that's more like it. Um, So I could try to be clever again, or I could just resign myself to making sense of this. Um, color long, direction long. No, that's the fact that I have um, a turn. There we go. And that's going to be equal to output um, color. 
output turn. Now this doesn't compile because I just renamed my function down here from uh, step into output. Now this has another problem because what? What have I not anticipated? Should match V of class character. Um, so we've got a problem now in my output statement. So I have a V and the V doesn't match something in my above stuff. So using these probably wasn't my most clever decision ever. I had an uppercase V mixed in with all the lowercase V's just to make things exciting. That's why you want to use, um, I don't know, non-character, non-string types. You want to have strong types. But uh, we lived on the edge. Barely lived. We survived it. Um, now we want to go back to our spec. So this is another advantage of test-driven develop uh, development, is that you can see your errors immediately and not go chasing them down. And, you know, maybe eventually I'll get the hang of the right way to do this. Um, so third, fourth, we did another left turn. After several more outputs, um, so we have a black, white, white, and a 1 and a 0, 0. So you have a single right turn mixed in with all those things. And we've gone seven steps. Um, however, the number of points that we've crossed um, is six distinct points. Um, just kidding, set has a dimension size. Um, there we go. So we don't really care about the length of the path that we've made. We just care about um, the set of points that we've covered. Um, so with that in mind, perhaps um, this is not, well, I'd have to make a mutable set. I don't know a convenient way to append to a mutable set and reassign. There's got to be a way to do it, but it's not worth doing. Because um, our program compiles and runs and does everything it's supposed to do. So, yeah, we just need to be... Um, should cover six tiles. And it does. And we don't need the trivial program because that wasn't part of the spec. Um, create a new whole printing robot and run the int code program on it. All right. So we're now going to switch from testing mode into running mode. Um, so let's take a look at our main.scala. Um, let's copy problem 10, make problem 11. I think that's probably a reasonable way to start as any. We have no output, and why do we have no output? It's because my run method doesn't produce output. You remember this hack that we put in here, that when I'm calling run, um, well, that's what happened. Um, we could pad the program, but we don't need to right now. Um, this is interesting. We don't really care if we're painting white or black, so we're going to paint everything white. 
Um, robot path to set size. Um, incidentally, maybe I create a convenience function here. Um, that uh, we call it like the number of tiles covered or something. Uh, count is equal to path dot two set dot size. Um, we could also say path dot distinct. We don't need the set. Um, so um, now I've introduced a new member, so I have to switch back into testing mode to make sure I haven't broken anything. Um, so we're going to switch back and take a look at the problem spec. And instead of calling path to size, um, we're just going to count the path. Um, oh, interesting. Uh, that's curious. Oh, because I called count on the path as opposed to count on the robot. There we go. So that compiles as I expected. Everything works. We're going to go back into running this and deal with uh, whatever behemoth of an error I've unleashed upon the world, which is... Um, 654 is out of bounds. Not a problem for my encode computer. Um, so I said we don't need to pad it. I lied. Um, pad to 1,000. Just pad that with zeros. Um, is 1,000 padding enough? Sure. Would some other amount of padding been enough? Like if I say 700. I typed an 8 instead of a 7. 800 is not enough. Is 900 enough? 900 is enough. Alright. Uh, well, that's cool. So, the output we have is 1. This is telling me that we went a single step. We did the Mars rover thing where we didn't get too far. Hmm. Interesting. So we ran the encode computer. Hopefully we ran the right program. That'd be nice. Um, uh, so resources 11.txt is my encode program. Uh, what I just added to main.scala is reading that program and splitting it by commas and so on and so forth. Um, so again, this is an expressive language. It's easy to script things in it. It's not too much harder than JavaScript anyway. Um, so, what do I want to do now? Oh, I'm sorry. I did the size thing at the end here again. Um, I want to count the number of step or the number of distinct locations the robot has visited. It's still one, which cannot possibly be correct. It seems very unlikely, unless the program is defective, um, which also seems unlikely. Um, so let's script something in here. Um, I guess we could print out something every time we step, right? Um, uh, 
All right. Should get some outputs, right? A zero and a one. Hmm. Not what I expected. Does um, my whole painting robot have an ID that I have to issue as an input? Like, we've got the puzzle input. Um, but is there some other input I have to provide to the input for my input to input? Otherwise, I go to space jail. Um, oh, the robot needs to be responsible for providing the input. <laughs> I see how it is. All right, they weren't joking. Um, yeah, this is a robot which contains an int code computer and not the other way around. Okay, I could have figured that one out, but I didn't. <laughs> All right, so I guess I need to define an input function. That just takes the current position and returns. Um... Okay, so now Um, here, the trivial input function is a zero, um, which is totally going to work and totally not going to backfire. Um, um, all right, so the fact that I've called this input now makes no sense. Let's see. Mm -hmm. I guess we'll just call that a signal. All right. Um, now this won't compile. I'm sorry, it will, because I'm being silly. Um, all right, so I've defined an input here, but the computer itself has an input. It has an ID. It has something that I'm providing as the parameter to execute. And it doesn't need that parameter. So the interaction here is going to be governed by not some input parameter. Um, interesting, too. So I've got this stuff here while it's not a three. And step input is not equal to address. Address is equal to PC. If the opcode is three, uh, step using the input and then continue stepping. Um, so this here was used to detect an infinite loop um, to denote halting of a program. That's not going to be a problem. Um, so step is going to return a memory address. Um, yeah, I think this will be OK. And instead of this getting the input um, the other way, it's going to get it from the robot. Um, probably want to close my loop. 
All right, zero steps. That's the thing. So while op is not equal to three. <laughs> I'm still not returning um, in the case of an infinite loop. All right, so I think I've hit an infinite loop here because I've removed all my infinite loop safeguards. 1104 is out of bounds. Oh, not an infinite loop. Hooray. Um, all right, so let's pad our program a little bit more. Let's say 1,200. Is 1,200 zeros enough? 10. All right, is 1,100 zeros enough memory? Nope. 1,200 it is. All right, so we're saying we've gone 10 spaces with that particular program. Now, I've broken my tests, too, so I should go back and retest. Just kidding. My tests only tested the robot. They didn't test the computer feeding into it. So the whole int code stuff backing this went untested. And that's why that was the defective part. Um, and I don't really care much to write in int code this instant. Although I'm sure in a second we'll find some reason to. Um, but yeah, let's type in our answer of 10 and submit it and that's not the right answer if you're stuck make sure you're using the full input data uh, there might be some more general tips etc all right so 10 is not correct or my submission through this form didn't work but more likely it's just that 10's wrong uh, so maybe we do start writing int code programs and testing it out because our tests passed, our program ran, and generated a int 10, and I'm not totally confident in what that 10 means. So maybe we add some more tests. Um, one of those tests could be just to make sure that this program runs. Not sure what the point of that would be. Um, alternative to writing this big messy test might be, oh, ha ha. You remember this, right? We never tested that. So that's why we got a 10. Um, yeah, so my problem space was ill-defined. My tests were ill-defined. <laughs> Let's fix our tests, even though I don't really want to. Testing feels like so much more work. Um, use testing when you can't figure out what the problem was, but you should use it in advance as well. Um, so the example program, I'm sorry, this is a simple robot. Um, this doesn't actually exercise uh, an int code computer, which could read and write stuff. Um, yeah, so there is stuff I could test even just using the robot. We don't need to test the computer on board. We know the computer works. It's been tested to heck and back. So step, 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 step. At this point, we could actually ask the robot um, one is equal to robot.input. Actually, we could assert this after every step is what color, um, what color did it just step on? 
Uh, that's going to be a one. And because our program is capable of all this other color crap. Um, all right, then this is going to be a zero and a zero and a zero. So a single time it's going to step on a square that it's been on before. Now, um, yeah, this should not just cover tiles, but it should paint them. Um, I'm only testing this from the perspective of the robot. I'm not even testing the, uh, the playing field. Um, just using the robot's sensory inputs here. So this here is going to be a map of int int. Um, mapped to type long. And where am I augmenting my path here? So, um, yeah, this is not going to be pretty. This is going to, I mean, I want to use a mutable map. And I'm not sure how to do that in Scala. Um, guess we'll figure it out. Oh, we've got a mutable buffer. Here, let's add a mutable map to that. Um, we don't even need a path anymore. Hooray. Uh, map.size will suffice. Um, kind of think that count is kind of self evident at this point. Um, so this dot map at x, comma, y is equal to something. No. Yes. Is equal to signal. There we go. And this is equal to this dot map at address x comma y. Which could be undefined. <laughs> All right. What have we got? probably some kind of undefined behavior error. Um, failed tests should paint six tiles. One did not equal zero. Well, that's a thousand times better than what I expected. Um, oh, I got rid of a member count. I knew that. So map.size, this should compile. All right. Um, and then we can go over to our test and where we had count. We just care about the size of the map. And now we can start dealing with real logic errors or parsing errors or whatever. Key not found, minus one zero. All right. So. Um, I should reopen my documentation that I had open a second ago. Um, so there's a get or else type or method. Um, I guess that's what we're using now. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what the syntactic sugar for that is, but, uh, get or else this with default value zero L. There we go. That works. So we painted six tiles and each step of the way we verified the color that was painted. Um, it'd be nice if Scala had a type 
that had a default or a map that contained a default value. Um, but that's okay. Um, all right, so now what? Uh, we just finished coding our robot. It passed the tests. Um, please tell me... Yeah, that's more tiles. 2226. This is probably also wrong. Let's not get our hopes too high. But if it is right, we can continue. That's the correct answer. You are one gold star closer to rescuing Santa. Beautiful. Part 2. You're not sure what it's trying to paint. But it's definitely not a registration identifier. The space police are getting impatient. Checking your ship external camera again, you notice a white panel marked Emergency Hole Painting Robot Starting Panel. The rest of the panels are still black, but it looks like the robot was expecting to start on a white panel, not start on a black panel. Based on the space law, space brochure that the space police, space, 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 attached to one of your windows, a valid registration identifier is always eight capital letters. After starting the robot in a single white panel instead, what registration identifier does it paint on your hull? Okay. Let me think about what this means. Do I have to know? <sighs> I'm confused. The robot was expecting to start on a white panel, not start on a black one. Well, I don't think I really care about where it started. I just care about what the message is that it expected to have printed. So now I actually do care about like printing out the output as a 2D array. Kind of like what got done for problem 8 there. So how do I translate this set that I've assembled into a well-ordered message? Because it really doesn't matter what the starting point is. Oh, I'm sorry, it says it's expecting to start on a single white panel. Never mind. Um, so there's two problems here. One is that the initial panel is expected to be white instead of black. And two is that... Um, <laughs> two is something. <laughs> um... All right, so we want to write a test. So I want to assert, even before the robot has stepped at all, that the initial panel is white. And why do I want to assert that? Um, because that's the environment that we live in. Oh no, it failed. So, um, so we need to code that assumption in, and the easiest way to code that in is to just hack it into the data right here. So we got a map, and that map consists of a single point. Um, so Scala map. How do I use a Scala map and populate it with a single value? 
I'd rather do that in the initialization list if I could. Um, oh, okay, so key arrow value. So key is going to be 0, comma 0, and arrow 0 L. There we go. And that still failed. Because um, it's supposed to start on a white tile. I knew that. There we go. That was easy. So we've written a test, and we've passed the test. And all was well and good. Um, uh, it's true that my description of the test uh, is wrong. So start on a white tile and paint six tiles. You know, I don't think it it shouldn't it couldn't have mattered that it starts on a white tile because the first damn thing it does is paint on the tile on which it stands right did i read that incorrectly no it did this was not specifying the example given had in its example that you were painting and stepping but you don't have to do that all right, um, but I think this poses another problem, which we'll see in a second here, just that if I go to run the same program, haven't I broken its output value, 2226? Yeah, 249. So I need in the initializer of this damn robot to specify what uh, the world is that it starts on. <laughs> That's great. Just what I needed. So yeah, when I specify a robot here, this robot will need a map in which it's doing its thing. I'm not happy. <laughs> I'm not impressed. So, I get that you want to have programs that can do dynamic things, but I've just lost the first half of my output. I've lost the 2226. And I didn't have that under test. And further, the examples they give don't test this. I still want to have a test for it. Um, do I? Well, I want to be able to produce the sample input. So, I guess this is what I'm doing. So because that map can't be, this is crazy. Um, I guess we're going to start with an initial basis here. I guess this also does force me to decouple the robot from the constructor of the encode computer, which maybe that's a good thing. Um, maybe. Probably not. Um, but now I'm going to have to define two computers or something. Um, now wait, when I'm saying program to buffer, okay, yeah, no, that's fine. Val robot is equal to robot with map, uh, with an empty map. Actually, yeah, I can specify here 
what robot I want to execute. Um, new robot. So here's the robot with no assumptions about the world. And we'll stick that over here, even though it's... This doesn't even belong in the encode computer anymore, but I um, can't be bothered to move it right now. Um, unspecified map. You're right. Um, so having a default map might not be a bad thing. And then problem 11, line 58. Um, here where we've got a robot. Yes, I do. I'm confused. So I've been saying I need to decouple the computer from the robot. I'm not completely sure. Coupling is really not proving as beneficial as I expected it to be. Uh, wait, hang on. Um, so I can specify whatever map I want, whatever robot I want. So by default, I still get the same output I used to have. Um, not found type robot. I'm flustered. Forgive me. All right. Um, unspecified parameter memory. Yeah. So over here, we don't need to execute a new robot. The robot is bolted to the computer in a way that I can retrieve both conveniently. Um, What have I lost here? Not enough arguments for a constructor with a robot and a memory and a base. Um, this is in the class itself at line 92, right where I'm at. Um, I thought this could assemble itself with a default robot, right? Uh, as long as I don't use the word new there. No. Type robot. Yeah, I don't know. We'll stick this last again, see if we can get stuff compiling, and then worry about what's the better way to format it. Robot.type does not take parameters. Okay, so this compiles again. Everything is sane as it once was. Um, so I'm trusting that like later problems are eventually going to make this more challenging and force me to decouple this. But right now they're coupled because... Um, that way I don't have to manage two objects at the same time. You have one manage the other. Um, 
so here we're saying a default robot. Okay, so I'm specifying that I can have a default map, but I can also override the map if I so choose. So if I want to have a robot with a more interesting map, I can still do that. Um, so here I'm using MK string to concatenate results from successive outputs of successive computers here. Um, we're still going to pad this to 1200, um, but I'm going to also specify in my computer, we got a buffer, uh, we've got a robot, and that robot has a map, and that map has an initial color that at zero, zero, the color is one long. Um, all right, so this expected attributes to be in sequence. Um, what's our other attribute? Base the zero. We'll put a zero in here. Um, maybe for my own sanity. I move that down a bit. Yeah, so we're going to take base out of the constructor, not allowed to be overwritten. New robot, new map. Map is an abstract constructor. However, if I wanted a map that contained that, I would use the implicit constructor. Um, Excuse me. Okay, what's the deal now? Required int. Oh, I'm sorry. So after this is, after my computer with my special new robot has executed, it's going to cover some number of spaces and do something. Um, <laughs> zero, zero contains one. I'm confused. So I can say val map is equal to map of zero, zero, with one L, right? That compiles. So if I were to pass that map in here, would that be okay? Um, okay, the robot itself requires something else. Um, what stuff to declare up here. I could declare the starting x and y positions. Um, uh, I could parameterize those, but I don't need to. Um, Incidentally, like I could give these data types. Um, in general, I haven't been doing that because it hasn't helped my analysis of the code much. But I suppose it could be beneficial. Uh, yeah, our own program counter. Not that we needed it. Um, so now what? So we alternate between printing and whatever. Um, 
Interesting. So, yeah, I need some binary way of knowing whether or not uh, the next instruction is a paint or a step. And, yeah, that's unfortunately all I get here. Um... So I guess PC program counter is about as good a name as I can get for something. I can't determine whether or not to paint or step from the color of the space that I'm on. So um, my robot is going to have a program counter, as is my other thing. I could have some sort of representation of, is this a paint instruction or is this a step instruction, but that's... At this point, it's not worth it. Um, that's as good as that gets. So the question here wasn't how many steps does the robot go, which is 249. But what is the eight character sequence that the robot prints out? And that's where this is going to get messy. Um, I mean, I could print out, here's all the points the robot's been to. That's not helpful. Um, what is helpful is if I can arrange that into a 2D array and print it out. Uh, so... How do I do that? <laughs> um, I think this program, this problem was fully expecting me to start with some other kind of data structure than a map. And so from that end, I've kind of shot myself in the foot. Um, I've definitely shot myself in the foot there. All right, that's cool. Um, maybe instead of a mutable map, I use a 2D array. Make sure we can still pass all the tests. A 2D array would have the advantage of being easier to print. And our robot's not gonna go like an infinite number of spaces. So, yeah, let's do that. Um, oh, but then we can't know how many spaces our robot's been to. That's kind of a problem. Okay. So yeah, we need to keep track of both. Well, that sucks. <laughs> oh god, that sucks. Um well. Well, well, well. Um How many panels does it paint at least once? So we don't actually care. Um, yeah, we don't, this isn't a program counter. This is just a counter. Um, and we're gonna increment that damn counter every time. And if that's equal to one, we're gonna paint. Otherwise, we're not going to paint. All right, kaboom. Integer literal found. Well, that's lovely. Um, OK. 
can I do this here? Is that fine? Illegal start of simple expression. Okay, what gives? Like, this was okay until I did that, right? Oh, it's because... I'm not even sure why. If I do this, is that a problem? Whatever. Alright, fine. Fine, we'll keep the program flow the same. We'll just increment the countdown there and it'll be okay. 788. Um, let's switch this back. All right. So to get the answer to the first question, we don't actually need the size of the map. We just need count over two. And that's also 2226. No. It's not the same. Okay. It's still not a program counter, but um, point taken. So what can I do now? I can just find a way to print that out. Um, Okay, I guess we're going to define a print function and figure a way to get the crap out of the crap. <laughs> All right, so what do we do? Um, fail array of type eval array is equal to array dot of dim I don't know there that'll be big enough oh wait eight capital letters I don't know let's say one by one um, let's see Um, map dot for each. I forget how to do this. It's gonna be great. Um, Scala map for each. We're gonna do something. Function f of a b executing a unit um oh right so for each something we're going to something for each key where a key is going to be um a comma b as well as a color yeah, so the color for each of those, we're going to say array at a comma b is equal to c. Um, am I doing that right? Wait, um, I'm doing several things wrong there. Let's try that again. For each a comma b comma c tuple. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's right. No, no. The key has got two aspects to it. Um. For each, we want array at key dot one dot one no this is taking us two parameters ah, for each point comma color uh, array 
at point is equal to color. There we go. We've written a valid something that compiles for not not found value C. Um, C is going to be an int. P is going to be an int comma int. And this is ridiculous. Um, this is Scala I'm looking at in my example, right? Oh, the, I'm sorry, this needs a function. So we have to put a, we have to denote our inline function with curly braces. Not found, value P. Um, Well, I am confused. Let's try that. All right. Found int int required int. Um, but this is a 2D array. Uh, P dot one, P dot two is equal to C. C is not an int. I just made that up. This is actually a long. Um, wait. <laughs> oh no. Is this really an array of int? I mean, I'm going to make it an array of char anyway, but um, I see. Um, yeah, let's, let's say long for now. Um, Type mismatch found int int long unit required other kind of int int. Okay, I did something dumb. I'm missing even more parentheses. What the hell? Why are more parentheses required here? I've already encapsulated everything in one set of parentheses. Um, that makes no sense whatsoever. I'm stymied. Like, if I add more, that's not going to fix this. We do recognize that, right? Um, maybe my mistake was using for each on this type. Um, and not doing an RTFM. Scala map. Scala collection map. Or Scala. So there's a git... There is a for each here, but surely there's a better way. Yeah, so for each takes a function that operates on the key value like the key and the value as a single thing. Um, apply F for each element for its side effects. Note, U parameter is required. Um, oh my god. To help scale C's type inference. I'm not happy about trying to read things back out of the map this way. I'm starting to think converting this map into a 2D array is probably more trouble than it's worth. Uh, 
Yeah. No, we're going to try the other solution. So, here we've got a map. But, um... How do I inform this? Our map's actually going to be an array of... Okay, so the other stuff I did here... Our, our path is going to be this map. No, no, no. I'm not happy with that either. Our map is going to be an array of dimension 2. How do I declare a 2D array in Scala? What's the type of a multi-dimensional array? It's an array of an array of something. Uh, here, we're going to call that an array of an array of char. Um, but also we require a path which is still going to be a mutable thing, but it doesn't need to be a map anymore. Um, so how do I do a mutable set in Scala? I'm pretty sure a mutable set in Scala, yes, you just import the mutable set interface. Um, all right, and this here will say what? Um, is equal to array dot of dim two and this will have type char. And we still need the end of the initializer. Um I do still want some way to initialize my state here. Um, so one one will not be sufficient. We'll get there when we get there. Um, but first color we want encoded into this. Um, <laughs> this map at x at y is going to equal sig um, if signal is equal to zero, um, print a dot, else print an octothorpe. All right. Um, this dot path, uh, dot put x comma y. Didn't really specify the data type of the set, but this is going to be a set collecting type int int.
You know, I shouldn't break my program. Um, so even though I like the name map here, um, sorry, I keep going back and forth and back and forth here. We're going to call this the map. We're going to introduce a thing called the ship. And that's going to be of type what? Array of something. Had that up a second ago. I've already forgotten the syntax. My goodness, I've had like 35 tabs open here, and I still can't find the one for the 2D array. Um, Scala multi multi dimension array type. So yeah, we know we can create them. Oh, it's an array of an array of a value. All right, um, here where we print, we're not only gonna set the map value, but we're gonna set this dot ship. Actually, it's the whole. So the whole at x at y is equal to if signal is equal to zero, a period else uh, an octothorpe, an eight sided thing. All right. Um, all right, so where's my arrow problem? Oh, right here this print thing. Um, all right. Value whole is not a member because I called it a ship in one case and I called it a whole in the other. Uh, next error we're going to get is that that's out of bounds. And uh, for that to be fixed we'll have to start at a different point. It's just amazing how this all builds on itself. Um, but if they told me I would have to start at a different location, I would have started somewhere else. Um, all right, so we're going to start at 100, 100. And this is not going to be a 1 by 1 char array, but a 200 by 200 char array. Um, and down here, where we're going to, we're saying we're going to start somewhere else. Um, I'm going to start at 100, 100, and really that should be a parameter, and not something hard coded. Um, so let's go fix that. Um, bar x int is equal to 100, bar y int is equal to 100. So those are now vars declared in the signature. So if I so choose, I could parameterize them over here. Um, val x is equal to 100, val y is equal to 100, x, y, and then over here I can say x, y map. And then we can experiment with different dimensions and stuff. Now I'm curious, can I do tricky things here? 
Like, can I say that this is equal to 2 times y? Probably not. Not found. Value y. Yeah, didn't think so. Um, so, if I want to try to reduce the space, and maybe I do, let's cut that in half. Let's say it's 50 by 50 and see if this executes the slightest bit faster. Um, just because I'm going to be executing this tons of times, not just for this, but my environment runs all the tests and runs all the programs on a pretty regular basis. I'd like for them to be somewhat expedient. Um, so you got a. Also, we're going to get some ginormous output. Let's take a glance at it. Um, so we've got a map, but separately we've got a hole. And that hole has some kind of image embedded on it. <laughs> I don't think putting a space between that's the right thing to do. Okay. Lovely. Oh my gosh. Because that's a 2D array, I need to print out every stinking line of that using MK string. Um I had to do an array of an array of char. I was not thinking. I mean, I could map each array of char to a string. I guess that's what we're doing. And then we'll make string here like that. Okay. Can an array of char not be converted into a string? Or just not the way I was trying to do it? Alright, so we got some kind of message being printed out. It kind of overflowed here, but that's the idea. Um, so what's our message? F... My god. Just had to print that way. <laughs> H, B, G, L, Z, K, L, F. Yuck. I don't care for that. Could I get my robot pointed in a different direction to start printing? Just for my own sanity. Um... No, because that'll break my tests. Damn. All right. Uh, I have to parameterize the direction. All right, fine. This still compiles. No, it doesn't. <laughs> All right. Um... So before that, we had a direction, and it was an up caret, and there's still a direction, it's still an up caret, but if I point this to the left first, can I get my text oriented a bit differently? Maybe even not spam my console so badly? Uh, let's try 50 by 20. Um, Actually, if I'm being smart, if I want to see this as early as possible, I'll increase the y value. Because there's a ton of blank lines. Nope. About 50 by 70? Nope. Wow! Okay, this is strict. Um, does that still print? Have I busted it? Alright. Um...
There we go. We get some kind of message. Um, here, let's big string putting a new line between the two elements. And then we can get the message out like this. It looked much more beautiful the other way, didn't it? All right. Um, Oh, because not all the lines are of equal dimension. All right. So there's the message. That not all the lines are of equal dimension. So now what? I want to rotate the damn string so it doesn't spill my console every time. Um, yeah, that's kind of cool, I guess. Wait, can I fill a default value into every cell here? So I know I'm printing things that look different. Um, yeah, let's see. 2D array of char. With a default value, perhaps? Or can I do array.fill or something? Gala array fill. Oh, returns a five dimensional, four dimensional, three dimensional, two dimensional array that contains the result of some element computation a number of times. Um, that seems less convenient than, like, I don't want to have to do a computation to fill the array. Nope, that example doesn't explain how to put in default values. <laughs> of dim. Okay. How to create and initialize a two dimensional array, but that's in Java. All right, well, this sucks. Um, I guess we're using fill, even though that's ugly. I could do a replace on this output. That just seems wasteful, but... Um, I mean, what else can I do here, right? First of all, in my output message... Um, yeah, the first letter is an H. And H, everything just aligns. I could just rely on that little knowledge and not have to worry about alignment. But um, let's try to keep with the spirit of this and do something more challenging than we need to do. So array of dim, 100, 100 was way too much. Um, because this only spans like eight characters in one. Huh. Oh, it did say eight. The damn thing told me eight. And yet I created this ridiculous space here. That's okay. So now, uh, 
I'm causing myself way much way more trouble than I need to trying to read this. I've read the answer already. I just want something elegant. Because I'm stubborn. And I'll worry about performance later. Confused. Why am I always confused? All right, so making this. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I might need the hundred by hundred array anyway for different reasons. Because the first time the program just wanders off, the robot wanders off in some weird direction. Um, oh, right, so we were talking about array.fill. And this is gonna fill using something. Uh, yeah, none of the examples given in their documentation explain a simpler way than calling fill. Implicit arg zero to class tag t. Wait, does that mean I can just do like fill 100 by 100 with um, just a dot? That found, but yeah, whatever. So here is my earlier attempt, and this just didn't line things up right because there's dots in some of the lines and not others. And the dots offset everything, and it's it's sad. Now if I strip out the trim, this should print correctly then. I don't need the trim. It's just I got filled with anticipation and stopped thinking instead of rereading the problem. No. Um. Um, uh, well, I guess I'm stuck with an inelegant solution. Um, that's sad. Could I, uh, could I make this point left and still print out the same thing? No, I can't because things don't format correctly. Um, so there's an of dim function. There's a fill function.
There's a range function, a tabulate, returns a 2D array containing values of a given function over ranges of integer values starting from zero. Tabulate would actually produce what I want. It's ugly as hell, but um, Map this. All right, and then we have our function here, which is just going to return a single dot. And apparently, we need to actually specify this as a function. And that's apparently not enough of a function specification. Why not? I don't know. That looks like a function to me. Missing parameter type. So you're telling me you can't do a implicit parameter type deduction here. Still can't deduce type. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, fine. Um, int, int. Now you're going to tell me the type mismatches. That I shouldn't have an, um, an int, int, but I should have a tuple, int, int. And then you're going to tell me that the type mismatches because this should not have been a tuple. This should just have been two ints. Um, but this shouldn't have been too... Oh, I'm sorry, this is still being recognized as a tuple. Um, so I'd hope type deduction rules can figure that out. Yes, yeah, so there's all my dots. That's ugly, but functional. So we did state that the ship was expected to be all black to begin with, and it is. We have a black ship. A very, very black ship. Um, if we so cared, we could start coloring it. But um, So now that we've got all the dots there... Um, I can print my label upside down. Um, now, note this hasn't done much for my output here. We're still, in fact, we're generating more output, but at least now it all lines up. So now the hunt can begin for the correct x and y values and the map to provide. Um, so. Here, um, mm -hmm. so here we have a hole, which is a different shape. Array dot of dim, a uh, hundred and ten. Wait, no, we need tabulate here. Um, for dimensions 110. Now let's start with something simple. 100 and 100. Now these X and Y are only used for my stuff here. This should be okay. to deduct, deduce for a comma b, uh, whatever types those are, this needs to return a dot. 
All right, so we're out of bounds almost certainly. Let's start in the center of a slightly larger hole. We're still out of bounds um, because I'm not passing in my hole as a parameter the way I thought it was. So we have a map and we have a hole to paint and let's actually paint it this time. Not null. We've used that too many times too, but um, all right. Um, not found value hole. That's because I twice declared this as a null instead of a hole. Let's try with an H. Maybe that'll work better. Um, what have I done wrong this time? Index out of bounds 20. All right. Um, all right, all right. So, fine. Let's try something less ambitious. 50 by 50, all right, that seemed to work. If I move the Y to a 10, that seemed to work. If I now decrement the second bound here, that was the wrong bound to decrement. Um, it's this one that we need to decrement to get 20 rows instead of 100. Still no bueno. Oh my goodness. Can we change this to 80 by 80? Does that explode? All right. Can we change this to 80 by 40? No. 80 by 60? All right, so for whatever reason, I've got a number of rows and a number of columns. Um, and I'm not using X and Y in a consistent manner at all. And it's driving me bananas. Um, um, because my Y values are all messed up. Try this. I'm calling it X, but it's really Y. I'm calling it Y, but it's really X. And just so I don't completely drive myself mad, um, we're gonna call that R and C. I've already got a C somewhere here, don't I? Surely I have a variable named C. No? Okay. At some point I did. Um, at some point in my life. That point is not now, and I don't need to care about that point right now. But, um... Alright, so... Also... Because I can once print on some special hole doesn't mean that every time it needs to be that hole. Um, um, so the data type here is char xy. Oh, I freaked out because. Uh, For a second there, I thought that I had completely lost all my coordinates, all of any logic I might have once had here. Um, so X is now C, and Y is now R, and we're going to move the row and the column like this. And now we're going to deal with all my stupid out of bounds nonsense. Um, so, what have I done wrong this time? Uh, 
array index out of bounds exception 20. All right, so I've changed my coordinate system. Uh, oh, these both started at 10. That's lovely. Um, all right, so tabulate 20 rows, 60 characters a piece. Um, and here we're going to specify a row and a column. Oh, I actually do require variable names here that are informative. I can do that. Okay. And I'm assuming I'm still out of bounds. Um, the simplest solution is just double everything until it starts working and then work my way backwards. So that's what we're going to do. Fifty, fifty, a hundred, a hundred. All right, 80, 80, 40, 40. Let's see where this breaks first. Okay, that didn't help too much. Hang on. I'm guessing columns are where this broke first. Nope. All right, 50, 50, 100, 100. Am I still printing this in the right orientation, by the way? Yes, yes, it's still. No, I'm not printing that in the orientation I expected. It is a valid orientation, but that's. Huh. And. If I put an up arrow here, I suppose that it actually prints correctly. So all these problems I inflicted on myself are because I got my X and Y coordinates reversed. Lovely. So that was entirely self-inflicted. Okay, that's cool. Um, let's reduce each of these. Uh, so we get an 80 by 80 grid. Um, what the hell? How did I break it? Oh. No, it's only the second robot that uses that 80 by 80 grid. It's at line 73 at line 71 that this breaks. I'm so confused. This prints, right? And if I reduce my column count, I'm oh, sorry, if I reduce my row count, let's re just reduce my initial position R wise uh, to 20. Can I do that down to 20? Will that still work? Because the problem says that this is going to print out an eight character high message. So I would hope that like it doesn't need my entire screen here just to print an eight character high message. Um. Okay. Ten by twenty didn't work. Oh, ten by twenty does work. Um, there's still a lot of wasted space here. 
can I change my initial x position or my initial column? Can I keep reducing that? 30, how about 20? Can I start at 20? Can I start at 10? All right, let's start at 10, 10. And try 60 characters wide and see if that captures our output. All right, our output is upside down. So as much as I said I had already solved this, that's kind of a cop-out to say I had actually solved it. Um, all right, so now we're out of bounds again. That's familiar territory. Let's start at 30-30 uh, with a 60 by 60 grid. Does that give us enough space? Nope. 30-30 um, with a 80 by 80 grid. Is that enough space? About 40-40, is that good enough? What gives? How come this is not large enough? Also, if I were smart, I would use relative coordinate systems at this point. All right, so we got some kind of message printed out here. Over 100 lines of output. It's still backwards. How did I manage to get this so wrong every way that I put it? I don't get it. Um, okay. So I guess because I got my coordinate systems wrong, If I'm facing upward, my row and my column. Oh, I am printing out the zeroth row first. That's true. All right, but now I've got this like rotated completely incorrectly. Yeah. Um, I'm just confused how like every time I do something with this, I get it completely wrong. So now we've got, we're a 180 from where we're expected to be. Um, and that's correctable by um, having a different different initial orientation. Or I could change how this works. I could change plus one to be minus one, minus one to be plus one, and nobody would be the wiser. kind of what I just did. Now, let's try to keep this as simple as possible. Oh, I'm sorry. My This is why I'm having the orientation problems, because I've already inverted my robot. Now, if I uninvert that, um, at this point, I should get a message without any of the letters backwards. There we go. So we're kind of sort of back in business. Um, that explains all the weird off by one errors we were getting. 2020s, probably fine. 80 by 60, no. 60 rows, 80 columns is certainly enough. The 
70 columns enough? Probably not. Oh, okay. That's better. Um, all right, can I scroll up to see my message? Okay, so we still got another like 10 or some extra lines in there. Uh, so let's pad this using a new line there. Um, can we start at row zero and start printing? Yes. Can we start at column zero and start printing? Also yes. All right. Um, can I just print 10 rows? Yep. All right. Um, and I don't know how many columns we need, but 10 rows is more than we needed. Um, that's beautiful. Over here. Now, I'm just curious if I put this back to being spaces. Does that. Okay. So this still does look a bit special. All the special characters are at the end of the message. Um, Six by thirty is not enough. Six by thirty six. Six by forty. Six by forty four. Six by forty three. Six by forty two. All right, fine. Whatever, now we know the dimension of the output. Isn't that beautiful? Um, so there's our beautiful-ish logo. I don't really care for all the extra padding in there, but uh, who am I to be a critic? Um, to improve performance, I could actually trim the output here. So here we make string, and before dumping it, let's strip out all the trailing characters. And that's what got me. There we go. So a nice, beautiful ship hole. This ridiculous looking logo on it. And hopefully by this point we've changed the ident uh, we figured out what the identifier is, and the twenty two twenty six is still correct. Oh, um, I still need to verify that my tests run, because almost certainly those have been broken by all the stuff I've introduced. Um, so. So I guess the moral of the story is that you're supposed to write a lot of tests. Um, should start on a white tile and paint six tiles. Oh, start on, on a white tile is optional and not part of the test. If I wanted to have a test to verify that we started on a white tile, that at this point, the test is not worth it. Um, all right. Cool. Not really, but we'll say it is. Um, uh, yeah, so run. We're going to take that message HBGLZKLF and submit that and post our answer to Mastodon. Not really, but all right. Um, you have completed day 11. Share on, uh, you can share on Twitter, Mastodon, 
this victory or return to the calendar. All right, let's go back to our calendar and try day 12. The end body problem. All right, I heard some news about this from friends. Um, so uh, let's see how this, if I go down, yeah, let's read this out. Um, but also, uh, whoops, didn't mean to shut that down. The space near Jupiter is not a very safe place. You also need to be careful uh, of a big, distracting red dot, extreme radiation, and a whole lot of moons swirling around. You decide to start by tracking the four largest moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. After a brief scan, you calculate the position of each moon your puzzle input. You just need to simulate their motion so you can avoid them. Each moon has a three-dimensional position and a three-dimensional velocity. The portion of each moon, uh, the position of each moon is given in your scan. The x, y, and z velocity of each moon starts at zero. Simulate the motion of the moons in time steps. Within each time step, first update the velocity of every moon by applying gravity. Then, once all moons' velocities have been updated, update the position of every moon by applying velocity. Time progresses by one step once all of the positions are updated. To apply gravity, consider every pair of moons. On each axis, x, y, and z, the velocity of each moon changes by exactly plus one or minus one to pull the moons together. Uh, for example, if Ganymede has an x position of 3 and Callisto has an x position of 5, then Ganymede's x velocity changes by plus 1 because uh, 5 is greater than 3, and Callisto's velocity x changes by minus 1 because 3 is less than 5. However, if the positions on a given axis are the same, the velocity on that axis does not change for that pair of moons. Once all gravity has been applied, apply velocity. Simply add the velocity of each moon to its own position. For example, if Europa has a position of x equals 1, y equals 2, z equals 3, and a velocity of x minus 2, y 0, z 3, then its new position would be this. Uh, this process does not modify the velocity of any moon. For example, suppose your scan reveals the following positions. Simulating the motion of these moons would produce the following. After these steps, then it might help to calculate the total energy in the system. The total energy for a single moon is its potential energy multiplied by the kinetic energy. The moon's potential energy is the sum of the absolute values of its x, y, and z coordinate positions, or position coordinates. Um, a moon's kinetic energy is the sum of the absolute value of its velocity coordinates. Below, each line shows the calculations for a moon's potential energy, uh, kinetic energy, and total energy. In the above example, adding together the total energy for all moons after 10 steps produces the total energy in the system, 179. Here is a second example. Uh, for 10 steps, this is what gets simulated. Total energy, what is the total energy in the system after simulating the moons given in your scan for a thousand steps? Now, uh, that's interesting. So, we do happen to know something about energy, and that's that it's always conserved. Um, it's not like we're changing planetary... I mean, even if you were to convert kinetic energy into mass, 
and that would maybe not be represented in this model, but the energy would still not be lost. It'd be converted into mass. Um, still. Uh, so the potential energy is the sum of the absolute values of the coordinates. That's an interesting definition. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, this definition probably doesn't match real world physics, um, but that's okay. So yeah, you want to simulate this particular model and you have a ton of input to work with. Um, so I think it's fair to say that even though I was rip roaring to go, start to code this one, um, a break might be very appropriate um, so I can get food and regain my sanity. Um, so, yeah. Might just leave it there for a bit. Um, you can use your imagination. The other part of this, I'm not sure how I'm going to download that English description and convert it into a test file. Um, I should do one more thing before I head out, though. So, uh, so I did produce some new files here. Um, oh, I don't remember changing main Scala problem spec 10. Uh, uh, or problem 10. What did I change there? Oh, this is me. Yeah. Uh, is that just a minor code cleanup thing that I did to my problem 10 solution? I meant to show that off and explain it and commit it at the beginning of this stream, um, this session. But, um, oh, wait, no, that was us fixing some incompatibility between my Scala and our everything else versions. Um, so we're going to add that. Um, use signum instead of sign. Get add this. Get log will show my previous commit messages. Uh, so this time we're solving day 11. Status shows the files to be committed. Commit with message for solving day 11. And we push that to the cloud and day 11 is solved. Uh, we're going to come back a bit later for day 12 um, once I've had some food and maybe even a little time to think about this strange version of physics. Um, so conservation of energy, the little shortcut I wanted to write uh, won't work here. Uh, the reason it won't work is because each planet has a different mass and the interaction between, or each moon has a different mass, and the interaction between the moons um, does something with energy that's not real world stuff. So, um, I am curious, and this is something else I will have to think about, and really, I should be writing the tests first and then thinking. Um, but what has my curiosity is... Uh, oh, here it is. Um, yeah, multiple velocity adjustments based on the position of other moons. So the outermost moon is going to get pulled the most toward the axis. And if you have moons on parallel axes, or adjacent axes. Uh, I'm sorry, if the moons, um, if you have a whole bunch of moons on four and one moon on five, they're going to switch locations. So um, there's going to be some weird oscillation stuff going on. But I find it strange. Like, you think that this particular model would produce a convergence, and maybe it does. Um, We'll find out. 
there is a phenomenon called zizigy, which has to do with multiple moons moving around each other and the whole system being chaotic and unpredictable. Um, I think it's more confusing than this model, but also I'm surprised how like these moons just do their thing over Jupiter and completely ignore the gravitational pull from Jupiter. So I guess that Jupiter effect and the moons, well, the moons initially having a velocity of zero is, must be relative to the planet's surface. And here they're just cycling about each other um, with really strange version of gravity. So, um, yeah, should be writing some tests, but also need some food. Also, this is just uh, I know this uh, example with so many test details is going to take a lot of work to get implemented, um, even just writing the tests. So we're going to break. Uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.